standing up in McKinney. This is According to Callus. It, it is a Wednesday. It is November the 16th. And today we're going to do the first of the, um, I guess we'll call it a commentary on Rules for Radicals by Mr. Saul Alinsky. Now, for those of you out there wondering, why in the world would I read this book? This is a bad guy. You know, he dedicated his book to Satan and all this other jazz. That may all be true, but if you want to better understand where people are coming from, if you want to better understand your enemy, how better might you accomplish that than to read their own words, to figure out what it is that they are doing and why they're doing it. And once you understand how they do it, you can do a better job of counteracting it. Now, most of this stuff is essentially 60 years old. Let's call it 50 to be generous. Most of this stuff um, is clearly dated, but the principles, I believe, hold to be generally true. The ideas presented can be accurate, though they will need to be adopted or adapted to the modern era. And I will tell you, that that doesn't mean that they lack um, presence. It, it doesn't mean they're not relevant. It just means that things have changed and we need to understand why. Now, you can be assured the Clintons utilized things out of this in their rise to power. I mean, we all know that Hillary spent time with him back in the day. You can be further assured that Obama used tactics in this book to win his presidency. Now, the problem is, I can hear you right now, but as good Christians, we shouldn't do this. As good Christians, we shouldn't lie. We shouldn't abuse the truth. We shouldn't, you know, obfuscate what we're trying to do. We shouldn't mislead people. And all that can be 100% true but it doesn't mean that you can't and shouldn't understand the principles and the objectives that are laid out in here. It doesn't mean that you can't do it without giving up your principles. It doesn't mean that there isn't something to this. So I was listening to John Harris. He does a podcast called Conversations That Matter. If you have time, you might want to check that out. He does a really nice job with that. And quite frankly, he probably has a lot more time into keeping his audio good and having nicer uh, intro music, or at least cleaner intro music. I love my intro music. Point in being is, he said, and I'm going to paraphrase, um, essentially the way they undermine and ruin the scouting organizations, the way they undermine and ruin so many other quote unquote Christian organizations is they put their people through all the preliminary things. They got them jobs or positions within those organizations, and they let them roll up until they got it further and further into power. And once they got into power, they revealed themselves to be the charlatans they always were. They revealed themselves to be enemies of the very organizations that they are supposed to be protecting. You need look no further on what happened to the Boy Scouts of America to understand exactly how that is. And the sad thing is the scouting organization invited those people in because they wanted the money and they thought those people were going to run, bring them in more money. But what they did is they hollowed out and destroyed what was left of the organization after their landmark case before the Supreme Court. Likewise, many churches have gone down this same path. I've referenced before the fact that we have many pastors that don't even believe the scriptures that they teach, that they don't believe that the Bible as it's written, that they don't believe so many things that are central to the faith, but they're there for a job. They're there to get power. They're there to propagandize something that doesn't go along with Christianity. They're there to inject their social justice. They're there to inject their climate worries. They're there to inject their left-wing politics. You can call it whatever you want, but the fact of the matter is, is we've sat there and we've watched it happen time and time again. 
And rather than expel these bad apples, rather than fight back against these heretical pastors, we just say, you know what? You can have the church. We're going to pick up sticks and go somewhere else. But that's exactly what they want. That's how they've destroyed the Methodist church. They're in the process of trying to destroy the Baptist church. And by that, I mean the convention, the the organization, if you will, the Presbyterians. They're, they're slowly chipping away and infesting and ruining everything that they get into. And the problem is we don't have an active counter. The problem is, is we haven't figured out that sometimes you have to protect power because power is necessary in order to fight back. And Mr. Linsky talks about the organizer. The organizer is the person that motivates, propels, and quite frankly, educates the leaders, brings them into a position of influence, networks their team, and gets them to a point where they can better understand their target audience. This is something that we on the right, and to a lesser extent, we as Christians have not done a good job of doing. It seems to me every time we adapt so that we can better communicate, we chip away at the very principles that differentiate us from the others. We, we, we sacrifice that on the altar of love or acceptance, but we lose our salt. We lose our light in the process of doing that. So might I suggest that we can use compromise, but use it in a wise way. We need to compromise from position of power. We need to get them to give us a little something. What it, we have done is watched it skillfully unfold that the left, the Marxist, the progressives, the communists, whatever you want to call them, has chipped away. And all we've done is, well, if we give them this, they'll be happy. If we give them this, they'll be content. If we give them this, they'll be happy. We keep buying time and we have nothing left. We are not Mother Russia. We cannot sacrifice millions of people and thousands of acres of land only to wear them out and come back and fight back. Now, yes, we may believe our Lord comes in and saves us all at the end. And that, I believe, is the ultimate end. But we're also called to occupy. We're, We're called to march out and hold the line and be salt and be light. And you cannot do that if you're always compromising away your principles, if you're always giving up little things here and there. Now, the idea is, he talks about self-interest. He talks about power. These are words, and he he talks about why they matter. They are about harnessing energy. They are about building an organization. They are about getting things done. Now, when people are motivated by their own self-interest, sometimes they get lost. Sometimes they go astray. But if the organizer, for lack of a better word, or their leader is there to shepherd them back in line, to keep them from going off into destructive means, we can do that. We can create political pressure. We can push back on these things. And I say this both from the standpoint of You can say you're a Christian conservative. You can say you're a Christian nationalist. You can say you're just a plain old conservative. You can say you're a plain old nationalist. You can claim to be any other flavor you want. But if you don't have any power and you don't have any organization, you can't push back. Now, I reference the idea from confrontational politics. You have to have an organization and you have to have money. Those two things allow you to have an effective fight. An effective way to push back. And we don't do those things well. And I've talked about many times how our people, the conservatives, the right, they have the money, they just choose not to invest in it. They choose not to set aside their own personal interest for the greater good. And you have to ask yourself, why might that be? Why is it that they don't want to do that? Some of it is, I've got mine, I'm not worried about you. Some of it is, that's not my problem. Some of it is, they don't see it as a wise investment. And you got to ask yourself, why don't they see it as a wise investment? What are they seeing that we're not seeing? What are they afraid of? Might I suggest to you that it's going to always come down to the fact that we have no organization. We don't have the ability to control a mass amount of people. 
And they say, well, you know, it's because we on the right, we like to think for ourselves. We like to do our own thing. We don't like being told what to do. And that's all well and good. But when you're building an army, an army has a general. When you're building an army, the army has lieutenants. They have majors. They have colonels. They are dealt or they are dealt the responsibility to deal with strategic issues. They deal with tactical issues somewhat, but they delve that out to the lower ends of the hierarchy. They, they hand that off to people that are more suited to that. You don't want to necessarily have your general leading the army from the front. Maybe you want the general on the side, in the middle, in the back, overseeing what's going on. He or she needs to see the big picture. They need to understand all that's going on. Maybe you take your colonel or your major or a really good solid lieutenant and you put them in charge of your attack elements and you send them out and you try and flank and you try and do this and you try and do that. As a general, that's the mindset that's in place. But we know from observation and from history that logistics overcomes the better army. Better logistics is where it's at. And what are the logistics that you ask? That's about supplies. That's about knowledge. That's about giving your soldiers, your army, everything that they need to go to battle by keeping them fed, keeping them bedded. A well-supplied army is a much stronger army than even the best trained army they're faced against. I don't know if you know this, this is a little gem. I, I, I forgot who I heard it from, so I'm not meaning to uh, not give credit where credit is due. So I will greatly paraphrase. But essentially, the German army, the Wehrmacht, was far more effective at killing the Allies than the Allies were at killing them. But we outnumbered them dramatically. We were out supplying them dramatically. And sooner or later, they failed. Now, you could say the same thing about the Japanese Empire. Let me pause here just a second. The Japanese Empire was far more effective. They got more done, but again, logistics, logistics, logistics. They got overwhelmed by materials and men. And there's nothing that that could be done about that. Okay, so all this is to underline and to show you exactly what is playing out. Okay. Now back in the sixties, now some of you that may be around that are, I don't know, 30 years older than me, you may remember some of this back in the day, they wanted proxies. They wanted votes on the boards of these corporations. They wanted to go in and basically dictate the terms on how those companies worked. They wanted to take over the companies without actually having to buy the stock to do it. So they would go in and they would get these proxy votes. They would, they would get control of companies and force them to make concessions in many cases with the unions and and in other cases with just other issues of the day. They did it to Eastman Kodak. They did it to Goodyear. And it's all in here. And he lays out exactly how it is. And the interesting thing is, is it's been copied and dealt with on steroids. You just need to look no further than BlackRock. There's two other organizations. I'm not going to name them because, you know, I'm this this podcast may very well be flagged. But they buy controlling stock or even just a high enough percentage that they force these companies to do what they want them to do. Do you really think that Ford, GM, or Stellantis, I guess is what it's called now, the formerly Chrysler, that they're really interested in building electric cars? That they really think that electric cars are truly a better product and they're the way of the future? Or do you think that they have no choice? That they're being pushed into that? And to make matters worse, governments are subsidizing this action so that they want to take advantage of the free money that costs them nothing. You may wonder how Elon Musk became the richest man in the world. It's because he mastered the system of getting government handouts. Now, to be true, SpaceX did do a lot of good things. And to a lesser extent, Tesla has done some good things. And I will tell you, they have made leaps and bounds progress on the electric batteries. But none of this would have come about if they didn't get the free government money. None of this would be allowed to continue or would be built upon without 
these activist shareholders to come in and push this agenda, whether it's climate change, whether it's World Economic Fund things, whether it's, you know, ending the coal and oil industries. None of this would come about if not for these activist owner groups that we give our money to, the retirement funds are going to, and we're working against ourselves. So I will tell you once more, if you are a very well-off conservative, why are you turning your money over to these people? They're actually at the point, this point losing money for you because they're investing it in schemes that cost you money. Why not take your money or some, or some of your money or a group of your friends that have a money and start buying some little local businesses? Why not invest in things locally? Why not make a presence known? Because you know when you do that, you create a separate economy. You create an opportunity to build your army to build your organization, to put money into the battles. You can't win if you don't show up with money and people. Interestingly enough, as I've referenced, all these elections this cycle, they won off of money and an army. And name recognition goes with money, but you can have two of the three and still possibly win. But we've shown without any grassroots support, without any help from we the people, you're going to lose, especially if it's a tight race. I'm not even going to get into all the stuff in the rest of the country. I'm not going to get involved with the crazy that's playing out in all these other states where they legitimately have sold yet another election because we didn't go back and fix the problems of 2020. They've exploited it even more in 2022. So I'm going to tell you, Go read Rules for Radicals. This is just part one. This is the warm-up, if you will. This is the underlying rationale for reading this. I'm going to probably get about two more episodes out of this. I'll spread them out over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to cut it short. I've gone uh, kind of long the last few episodes, and I want to be respectful of your time. I would call it a winsome one day or a a winsome Wednesday, but we we did win some. We lost some. But we have to get our act together. We have to have a battle plan. We have to have money. And we need to move forward. Because our enemies are not stopping. Our enemies are never satisfied. Our enemies are coming for us. They're never going to be content until that boot is not only on our neck, but on our head as well. And our only option is to fight back with the tools that we have. And that means some of you out there, you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of that extra money you've got. You're going to maybe have to quit playing so much golf and spending so much time on your boat and come in back to the ground floor with the rest of us activists and get involved and do something more. And I'm not saying that to insult you. I'm not saying that to berate you. I'm just telling you, that's where we're at. We need your help. We need you to be willing to put a little bit more skin in the game. It's great that you can write a check, but we'd much rather have you directly involved where you can make a difference. And now as my allergies are getting the best of me, I'm going to call the quits for the day, but I'll be back. (laughs) And until tomorrow, I will see you on the other side. Hey, I want to thank you for listening to my show. If you thought it was worth your time, worth your efforts, if you thought it was the least bit educational, exciting, informational, whatever, I would ask that you subscribe to the show, that you like the show, that you share the show, that you follow the show, that you comment, let your friends know. Help me out. There are lots of uh, algorithms working against me. I watched my numbers drop precipitously in the week before the election. I was on track to meet my goals. And what do you know? The week before the election, everything went to nil across the board. And I can't be the only one that that experienced that. So I would ask you, if you found this to be worth your time, if you think I could do better, hey, go ahead. Put that in the comments. Subscribe. Let people know we are doing our part to make a difference right here in McKinney, Cowan County, Texas. And I would really, really appreciate your help with this as we get back on track to growing the show. Thanks a lot and you have a great night.